Hey Scott, just so you know, we're uh, live. Okay. Can you hear me? So I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, my name is Nicholas Gellery. Uh, I go by Gilly. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a Garner Fellow for Lambda Legal and sit on the board of the Tenure Legal A Clinic Houston. Um, first off, I want to acknowledge that this is a very stressful time. As a trans person from Texas, I completely understand. Um, but just so that you all know, um, I, along with other panelists, are continuing to do everything we can for the community. On that note, let me introduce our uh, organizational partners. We have Doctors for Change, the Lambda Legal Resource Center, and the Transgender Legal Aid Clinic, Houston. So today we'll be talking about why this update is needed, uh, where, uh, how you can get support, what actions to take, and what's next. And on that note, here's Shelly Skeen on why this update is needed. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, thank you for being here. Um, we know that the community is concerned about the session that we just went through uh, and also about the current special session. And we have seen, at least in our state, the most number of anti-LGBT bills that have been filed uh, ever and frankly across the nation. And mo most of those, many of them, about 40% have been filed in our state. So the reason we're here today is to talk a little bit about that, to talk a little bit about the special session and to talk about what you can expect with respect to a recent podcast uh, or interview that Governor Abbott gave with Mark Davis stating that he intended to take executive action to ban gender affirming health care for trans youth. And that's the purpose of today's podcast is to talk a little bit about that and to provide you with a holistic view from a doctor, a mental health professional, a little bit of a legal update, and then to answer your questions. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm uh, Scott Martin, an LPC supervisor at Resource Center. I'm also the director for their behavioral health. Uh, welcome everybody. Just want to start with, uh, we're here for you and this coalition has just started last week and we're just forming a lot of resources for this across the state of Texas for mental health. So just kind of keep posted and uh, keep updated with us. Um, we recognize the political climate and everything that's happening now is causing a huge stressor to everybody and uh, just want to talk a little bit about maybe best practices for mental health and what we're seeing here. Um, I took a little note, so I'm going to go to these notes for me. Uh, so our best practices is basically what we're seeing is to hold an affirming space for your child or youth. Uh, and what that means is recognizing pronouns. And we all know pronouns can be scary, right? We're seeing this every day. Uh, but just listening to your child, I think, or your youth is really key. Even if you don't understand things, let them teach you something about their authentic self is what we're learning. Um, second to that is I think allow the youth uh, at home or somewhere that they have their own space. Uh, what we have found is it's so powerful for a, a teen, a youth, just a teenager in general to kind of have their own space, but especially someone that's a uh, uh, trans or gender uh, um, non-binary, uh, just to have their own space to be more authentic and keep something that's really personal to them during this transition. Um, I think the last thing for us in mental health is 
uh, stay in touch with your child. Yes, they're teenagers probably, and that's hard, but uh, again, it's just listening, even if it's five minutes a day, just making a connection, right? Uh, that's real important. Uh, it'll make a big difference. Um, the last thing for us is even for the parent, for y'all and the care, the providers on this tonight, uh, you know, this is for you also. It's a change for everybody and the, the climate's causing anxiety and everything. So we are offering, uh, we offer here at Resource Center parent uh, and caregiver support groups. Uh, so that's real important to us. We're going to be starting a new support group in September. And I'll keep, uh, we'll keep this updated. And if you're on the mailing list here, if we have your email, maybe we can uh, send that out when it gets going. It will be free and it'll be on Zoom virtual. So you could attend anywhere in the state of Texas for us. And we're really happy to start that. And there's been a big need and we've been thinking about this for about a couple of months. So we're kind of we're really proud of this. Um, at Resource Center, we have Youth First, which is a, after school drop-in program for uh, teens, uh, I think 12 to 17 actually, and uh, allies also. Uh, it's a great program. It does have a family component to it. There's Friday night dinners. And I think the biggest part about it is youth can be with peers, right? You're not gonna know all the answers as a parent or caregiver. So this kind of provides uh, uh, specialists like us, mental health specialists, and the trained staff and youth first to kind of take that role a little bit. Um, the other thing for us is we also offer counseling. Uh, we see a lot of parents here for counseling uh, just to uh, help with the process also. It's not unusual for us to see both the child and parent here separate or together. So we love a family component here at Resource Center. Um, I think that's all for me. Just wanted to make sure that we're here for you uh, at Resource Center in Dallas. And if you, I think our numbers will be posted. If you have any questions after our chat, you can always call me after the seminar. Thank you. Awesome. Um. <laughs> It's okay if you want to move right along. Um, I'm, my name is Amelia Averett. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a primary care provider, provider, dual boarded in internal medicine and pediatrics. I practice at Legacy Community Health in Houston. Um, and I also serve as the vice chair of the board of Doctors for Change also here in Houston. Um, first and foremost, as we kind of get into medical care, best practices, and the importance of access for um, transgender and gender nonconforming youth and adolescents, is that I want to assure everybody on the call um, that there is energy and research in this field. And we as pediatricians are constantly re examining and reevaluating what these best practices are. As recently as 2018, the American Academy of Pediatrics released a statement on best practices in this field, which I used to research for this presentation. Um, it has influenced the education of new physicians going through training, as well as the ongoing medical education required of all licensed pediatricians. As a primary care provider, I feel it's my responsibility to ensure the safety and well being of all of my patients. What each patient needs in order to stay safe and what being well means for them is different for everybody and every family. And it requires a safe space and open, honest discussions to determine what these kind of metrics are for every individual and every family. As um, the research becomes more robust in this field, we've learned that gender is not only, is not part of biology, um, sorry, Gender is part of biology and development, and like with all of biology, diversity is normal and expected and really should be celebrated. Pediatricians should be asking all kids at all developmental nodal points about their gender as part of anticipatory guidance and screening. As part of a conversation about known developmental stages in childhood and adolescence, as y'all have all been through with your well-child visits, Pediatricians should be engaging patients in conversations surrounding gender, 
rather than waiting for a kid to say that they're worried that something doesn't feel right, or hopefully not, that it becomes a problem. Research has shown that watchful waiting um, is based on binary notions of gender in which gender diversity and fluidity is pathologized. It's assumed that notions of gender identity become fixed at a certain age, even though they start showing at as early as one years old and may continue to change over the lifespan. More robust and current research suggests that rather than focusing on who a child will become, valuing them for who they are, even at a young age, fosters secure attachment and resilience, not only for the child, but also for the whole family. Standards of care suggest that gender affirming care looks different for everyone and only through discussions and that patient physician trust can the components needed be identified and facilitated. These may include the very safe and very reversible components of gender affirming care, such as social and legal affirmation and even puberty blockers. The partially reversible component of cross sex hormone therapy can also be considered. And of course, the more permanent component of gender affirming surgeries. But what all patients and families need differs and best practices cannot dictate the affirming care plan for each individual, but instead empower a family to create their own and then do everything possible so that the provider can facilitate that plan in the safest way possible. Research has shown, unfortunately, that not providing this care has led to higher rates of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, self-harm, and suicide in transgender and gender non-conforming youth and adolescents. These youth confront stigma and discrimination that may force them to hide their gender identity for self-preservation and survival, even in the healthcare space, which eventually causes a decrease in accessing needed medical care. Outside of the clinical sphere, a lack of access to affirming care and affirming spaces leads to higher rates of homelessness, physical violence, substance use, and higher rates of sexual behaviors as well. Because of all these reasons and so many more, and because all of your children are beautiful and should be celebrated as such, primarily the need to provide affirming care to all patients of all ages identified by patients and families, it is important for all pediatricians to address gender and development as an essential part of their primary care practice. And that's my spiel. Next slide, I think. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Um, again, this is Gilly. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I'm a legal fellow at uh, Lambda Legal and sit on the board of the Trans Legal Aid Clinic Houston. Uh, I'll be discussing updating identification documents in Texas. Uh, we know it's very uh, important to have accurate identification documents, especially for youth as they join the school, uh, especially this upcoming school year. So in order to change your name and gender marker in the state of Texas, you need a court order. Um, there's no law explicitly giving courts this authority, so many courts don't issue them. Um, we're lucky to have Travis County, uh, who has a streamlined process to kind of get this done. Um, so uh, today I'll be going through the process of, in Travis County uh, about how to update your, uh, how to get this order um, so that you can update your documents. So first, uh, the first step is to collect, uh, to collect documents in support of your petition and order. For adults, you'll need a petition, order, fingerprints, and a doctor letter. For minors, you need a petition, order, birth certificate, doctor's letter, and a minor consent form if they're over the age of 10. So for doctor's letters, there's no surgery requirement. Uh, in fact, all that doctors need to say is that appropriate care and treatment and support of gender transition has occurred. Uh, additionally, for the petition and order, there are legal uh, aid clinics around the state of Texas that can help you, uh, assist you in drafting those orders. You can do this yourself. Um, there's uh, templates online at Texas Law, uh, the Travis County Law Library. However, uh, there's many clinics around to help you with this process because it can be kind of complicated. So once you have your documents to e-file into Travis County, in Fort, uh, to e-file, 
you'll you can e-file anywhere throughout the state of Texas into Travis County. In four to six weeks after filing, you'll receive an email with a with your order, uh, assuming there's no extenuating circumstances. And, and this will include a request for certified copies. I suggest three to five because you'll need those in order to update uh, your documents in e at each agency. This includes the uh, the driver's license office, the birth certificate office, as well as uh, with your ch child school district. So this kind of wraps up the identification documents, uh, but I think one important thing to focus on is that we have uh, clinics around the state that will help you with this process. In particular, I sit on the board of Transgender Legal Aid Clinic Houston. We have clinics um, every other month online, and we will assist you in drafting those documents and give you a step-by-step -step, uh, guide on how to file into Travis County. Um, while this is the end of the document process, I would like to talk briefly about testifying. I understand it's very important to testify, especially when it feels like every session legislators are going uh, are filing harmful bills. I encourage, in fact, I encourage folks to testify uh, and share how these bills will impact them and their families. By emphasizing the impact that these bills have on your families, not uh, you are helping folks like Lambda Legal uh, when they decide to sue in order to prevent these bills from being uh, being uh, enacted. In particular, limiting the language, uh, limiting how much you disclose about this identification process that I just w walked you through um, will keep the focus uh, on the impact of the families and not on the process so that we don't have uh, legislators going after this process. Uh, as I said before, there's no specific uh, law that grants courts the authority to do this, and we want to ensure that uh, that we're able to continue this process for trans folks uh, now and in the future. With that being said, I think it's a perfect time to introduce uh, Shelly Skeen again, and she'll just talk, uh, she'll discuss more about the legislator and uh, about some uh, current cases. Yeah. Next slide. So my name is Shelly Skeen. I'm a senior attorney with Lambda Legal and. Lambda works for full and lived equality for LGBT people and people who are living with HIV. We are the oldest and largest national organization that has done that. And in fact, we've been doing that since 1973. And so uh, let's talk a little bit more about what uh, has happened at the legislature. So during the regular session, what we saw with respect to what I'm going to call gender affirming care healthcare bans, so you'll hear me refer to these as healthcare bans, is really three sort of main buckets of legislation. One would make it so that the term child abuse in the family code now would include any type of gender affirming care. So if you are a parent and you consented to your child having that type of care, or if you are a doctor or a mental health professional, now, under the legislation that we heard before that never passed, um, what it would have done was, would have said that now that could be child abuse. And because it's child abuse, it would be subject to potential criminal penalty. So that was one of the buckets as far as the healthcare bans went. The second bucket prohibited gender affirming care outright for trans youth, not for intersex youth, but for trans youth. And we can talk more. I'm going to ask you all if you'd like. Um, we do, Lambda does two trainings a month on how to do a name and gender marker correction. And as Gilly was just talking about a minute ago, there are certain counties in our state that will do that. And because there's no clear law that tells us how to do that, um, it's different depending upon the county you go to. So I would uh, ask you all to join us for uh, one of our monthly trainings. Again, we do those about twice a month. We usually do them over the lunch hour. And if you're an attorney and you're on this call, you're gonna get a free CLE credit and also ethics credit, which I know is a big deal. So um, going back to our three buckets, the third bucket then would have prevented insurers. So uh, for example, professional liability insurers or medical malpractice insurers 
from providing coverage. So for doctors that wanted to provide gender affirming health care, they wouldn't be able to get medical malpractice coverage for providing that care if they were sued by a patient. Same thing with a mental health professional. And so that's the three buckets of what we saw initially. And none of those passed, they didn't get through the house and in part by so much great work that you all did, the families and the kids coming and telling your story. And like what Gilly was talking about a minute ago, we'll talk a little bit more about how to give your testimony. But what we want you to talk about when you testify is the impact on you and your family on legislation and how it might harm you. That helps us show and that helps us challenge a bad law if it is passed. So we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more specifics about testimony in a minute. But none of those healthcare bans passed. Now we're in a special session. Special sessions are 30 days long. The governor calls special sessions and in those special sessions, what he does is there are certain things that he lists as priorities that will be addressed during the special session. And right now, there are no priorities on the governor's call that include healthcare bans, but the governor can change the call at any point in time. What we heard last week during the Mark Davis show was that Governor Abbott, he was being interviewed by Mark Davis, and Governor Abbott said, I don't need to wait for the legislature to create a health care ban. I have a way that I can do that. He didn't specify how, but as you all know, the governor can issue executive orders. The governor is in part in charge of administrative processes and licensing in our state. And so we're not sure whether he's going to make good on his statement that he would uh, try to prohibit now doctors and mental health professionals from providing gender affirming care. We don't know uh, what that prohibition might look like if he does it. But the point of us being here and having this uh, call today is to let you know that you are supported. You're supported legally by Lambda Legal and the ACLU during the regular session, Lambda Legal and the ACLU said that if bad legislation was passed prohibiting this kind of health care for trans youth, that we would sue. We're still here and we're still saying that if the governor takes action to prevent folks from getting the medically necessary best practice medical care that they need. So that's another reason why we're here today is to talk about that. And we wanted Dr. Avert here. We wanted Scott Martin here. We wanted you to be able to see uh, Gilly to talk a little bit about the name and gender marker correction process in our state. And then me here to give you a brief update. So let me, now that I've kind of given you a little brief update about where we are, let's talk about what's happening nationwide just really briefly. So we have seen two anti-trans athletes bills pass in Idaho and also in West Virginia. In both of those cases, neither of those laws ever went into effect. And that's in part by the great legal work of Lambda Legal and the ACLU. Arkansas passed a health care ban, not unlike what we could see here in our state. And the ACLU challenged that particular healthcare ban in Arkansas, and it didn't go into effect. So the point of me telling you about that, and then I'm going to tell you about one other bill out of Tennessee. Tennessee passed a piece of legislation that would have made it so that businesses that were open to the public had to put a sign on their business telling people that they were going to allow transgender people or people who were uh, gender expansive or gender non-binary to use the bathroom that matched their gender identity. That law also was challenged and did not go into effect. So the point of me telling you again, I want you to hear, if you don't hear anything else, these laws are not constitutional on a variety of grounds and none of them have gone into effect. So I want you to know we're gonna do what we can. I can't guarantee that we're gonna be able to stop it here in Texas right away or ever. No lawyer can ever guarantee any results 
but I can tell you that we've already done it in other states and we're here to support you. So the last thing I wanna talk a little bit about, just really briefly, is testimony. If you all go and give testimony, because we fully expect the governor to ask for another special session, remember they're 30 days long, the one that we're in right now is going to last until about August the 7th. Uh, our best intel tells us that he's probably going to uh, call another special session on August the 8th, which will last for another 30 days. He may or may not include healthcare bans in the call for that special session. But if he does, and if you choose to go and testify before the legislature, a couple of things. Again, remember what you wanna talk about is the impact on you and your family. You wanna talk about the harm that you and your family might suffer. And you wanna talk about only what's within your personal knowledge. So what you can see, hear, and feel. You can't talk about what someone else is seeing, hearing, and feeling. So remember, start there. How is it going to impact you and your family? And then if the legislature's, legislators ask you any questions, I've got five tips for you, and here's what they are. Number one, always tell the truth and don't exaggerate what the truth is, because that means that your credibility is in lesson, and that hurts our cause. So stick to the truth, whatever the facts are, they speak for themselves and you can trust the facts and what you've experienced. Number two, if you're asked a question, answer only the question that is asked. Don't volunteer more facts. Don't volunteer extra information. Just ask the question that is asked. Just answer the question that is asked. If you're asked a question and you don't understand what the question is, you can say, I don't understand what the question is. Can you repeat that for me? If you don't understand a question, please don't try to answer it. Just say, I don't understand what your question is. Because sometimes legislators are gonna try to get you to say something that they want you to say. So just know that you can only talk about, again, what's personally happened to you or your family. Don't speculate about someone else's experience, what's happened to them what they may be thinking, or what might happen in the future. You can't possibly know what's going to happen in the future, but legislators are gonna to try to get you to agree with them about what, something that might happen in the future or something that is happening to someone else, and you can't talk about that because you haven't personally experienced it. And then the very last thing I would say is that if they are asking you a question about medical care, about something that's within the expertise of a doctor or mental health care that's within the expertise of a social worker or an LPC or a psychologist or a psychiatrist. You are none of those things unless you really are. So please don't try to speculate about what a doctor might do or what a me mental health provider might do because what they're trying to do is to get you to agree again with a legal conclusion when they're asking you questions that have to do with expertise that you don't have. So don't answer those questions. You can just simply say, I'm not a doctor. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not a doctor. I won't know what will happen in that situation. I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not going to know what's gonna happen. I can only talk about what I know as a parent and what I've experienced or myself as a kid and what I've experienced. So those are my tips on testimony. That's the lay of the land and I'm gonna turn it over to our uh, next person and it may be that we're in question mode, but I'll, uh, I'll go on to the next slide. Thank you. I think what, before we open it up to questions, we're just going to hit some highlights on um, steps we can all take to take action um, in this realm, in this sphere. Um, so the ones highlighted on this slide um, are to continue the ongoing efforts. And I really do want to applaud everyone for the tremendous efforts and the successes, right, um, that were had in this last um general session. Um, so keep up the pressure on your members of um, the Texas House and Senate. Follow Equality Texas and 
here you'll have um, access to a site too to um, for all those calls to action through Equality Texas. Um, stay tuned, keep your ears peaked um, for future news on Governor Abbott's um, executive action. Um, and then the next um, step to take action for name changes and gender marker corrections, there's um, these two clinics, legal clinics, that are available to help you um, get through that process. Um, yeah. Um, more resources for the name changes and gender marker corrections, which is fabulous. Um, I hope everyone can get access to that when needed. Um, and then, oh, I guess I'm speaking for you, <laughs> but anyway, other things, right? Self-care related and otherwise to keep the energy flowing because it can be exhausting and draining. Um, don't forget to breathe. Um, don't lose hope. You're not alone. Um, we're all working in this regard, whether we can see each other in person online or aware of what we're doing, but there's big momentum in this area. Um, keep updated and stay connected with friends. Don't forget to check in with each other. Just say, hey, how are you doing? What can I help with today? Um, and of course, we're here as things develop. Scott, I'm not sure if you had anything to add to that, but if you do, and then I have one small add, but go ahead and I'll be quiet so you can add something if you have anything from your end. Yeah, sure. Uh, for Resource Center, like I had mentioned before, uh, we do offer counseling currently, but we're going to uh, develop that free support group for everybody, and I'll uh, simulate that information. If uh, somehow I'll get back with, uh, uh, not for sure, Lou maybe, whoever's in charge of this, and we'll uh, assimilate that information and maybe be on the next presentation also. But yeah, I think uh, our, my message too, like Shelly was saying, and uh, everybody, like we're here for you. Like this is a, a lot for all of us and we're making changes and trying to be on top of it as, as well as we can be. So yeah, anything you need, my number at Resource Center is probably listed. You can reach out to me also. Yeah, and I just would add um, to Dr. Avert and Scott, I watched a lot of the testimony that the parents and the family gave, uh, families were giving during the regular session, and then again, uh, more recently during the special session. And I can't say enough about what a wonderful, wonderful job you all did and how compelling you were and recognizing um, how I'm not the mental health professional here, but how traumatic um, I'm sure it was and it had to be. I know there were times where I was sitting in front of the computer crying. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for all that you do. And last thing I would say with respect to the name and gender marker clinics, again, um, Lambda does the trainings, but um, I have spoken to the head of the UT clinic and immediately after Labor Day, they are going to start taking applications for uh, folks to come in and do a name and or a gender marker correction. And they are well aware that we are doing these seminars and they're ready for you to reach out to them and to be a resource. And so we are all here to be resources for you. Thank you. Um, I'd also just like to point out that these uh, sessions that we that we did today, um, we plan to have these reoccurring uh, monthly or as, act, as our things pop up, uh, just to let everyone know. Uh, our next portion is going to be the Q&A, so please feel free to drop any questions y'all have in the chat, uh, and we'll be sure to answer those. Okay, I did get one question about birth certificates. Um, so right now, currently, all you need is your order to update your the birth certificate in uh, Texas. Um, you want to make sure you get you get a new order issued and not an amended order. Um, 
that process is a little uh, a little complicated. You have to, uh, but it's pretty simple if you know what you're looking for. Um, if you go to the birth certificate office, they'll uh, direct you to a form online that you have to print and file and mail in. Um, I suggest uh, doing expedited shipping on that um, to get it done sooner because it can take a while, especially if folks are trying to get this done before the next school year. Can, can uh, Gilly, can you tell us what the question was? Or um, I'm not seeing it, sorry, my chat's not quite right. I, I think uh, Lou had it, um, but I don't see any more questions. Uh, does anyone have any questions uh, now? So let me just add a, a quick thing about birth certificates. Um, when you get a court order here in our state, you go through the Texas, well, it's, I call it dishes, but you go through the Texas uh, Bureau of Vital Statistics and there is a form online. Once you've got that court order that you can fill out and Gilly is right, you want a, you want a replacement birth certificate, not one that shows the prior name and the prior sex identifier or gender. Um, so know that, and there's only one state in the United States that will not currently right now change a birth certificate, and that's Tennessee. Um, every other state will change a birth certificate, and for the purposes of meta, for the purposes of school records, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because all school is required to uh, do when it comes to class rosters, name badges, diplomas, is to use your surname, is to use your last name. So if you are using a different first name, even though you're gonna have school systems tell you that you have to use the given name on your school records, that's not true, that's not what the education code requires reach out to Lambda Legal. We did a lot of work around this during graduation time. And in every instance, what we were able to convince the uh, principals and the administrators that they had to allow that kid cross the stage because the only name that was required was their last name. So that's one thing I think is important to know. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And sorry, Gilly, I hope that answered all some of those questions. Yes, uh, I think we have a couple more in the chat. If uh, Shelly, you want to answer those? Gilly, if you could, I can't see what the questions are. So could you read them out loud to me? And I'm sorry that um, it's just not working on my screen. No worries. So um, my daughter will need hormone blocker momentarily, is there a chance that this could be taken away from us if the, the law does pass um, while the legal process is going forward? This is my biggest worry. All yeah, right. and I think, I think uh, Dr. Avert, maybe you would want to like just, why don't you weigh in and then I'll weigh in on the legal piece? The computer almost let me not unmute myself. Um, so um, as far as the medical component, um, I understand the urgency um, in wanting to either initiate or continue um, puberty blockers um, as it can um, safely just delay one of the most distressing things that can happen to um, a gender diverse youth. Um, I cannot speak to the um, kind of how the prescribing will be if we're in this legal limbo um, once the executive order, um, if it does um, go through. So I'm going to defer to you. Um, but yes, we will do everything we can to continue providing um, the evidence-based care that we already are um, for every patient that comes into our clinic. So. Yeah, this is Shelley. Um, we can't, so we can't know exactly what the governor's executive order is going to look like. Um, and so until we know what the governor's executive order is going to look like, um, we, I can't say for sure whether it would prohibit puberty blockers on or about what age. But if that's the case, uh, what I can tell you is that we're going to do our best to stop that from happening 
prior to the time it would go into effect. I can't say that we'll be able to do that because again, I can't guarantee any results, but I can tell you that when it comes to Arkansas, for example, the law in Arkansas that would have uh, made it a help, would have prohibited gender affirming care did not go into effect before it was stopped. So we do our best that we can do, we could do that, but I can't, I can't guarantee you that that won't happen. Um, but you know that we're all here on your side to do that. And I think I see another question. Now I think my chat is working because user error here. I don't normally use WebEx. Um, but I see a question that says, should you, can you get a new birth certificate with a name change without gender marker changed? So the short answer is yes, you can do a name change without a gender marker change or you can do a gender marker change without a name change, or you can do both a name change and a gender marker change. And then Gilly, let me not trample on your feet. Um, if, no if Gilly, <laughs> Okay, so let me, let me um, I think Gilly's probably pretty attuned to some really, really great new news about X gender markers. Uh, from a nationwide perspective and then also has a pretty good feel for what that looks like on a state by state basis. So maybe Gilly, you could answer the second part of this question, which says, uh, my child is non-binary and Texas does not have an option for a non-binary gender marker. Uh, so you chose not to change it. Um, maybe Gilly, could you talk a little bit about uh, the Zim case and talk a little bit of, yeah, go, go for it. Yes, so recently the federal government has decided that they will now allow um, X gender markers on passports. Um, this is a very new um, thing and it comes after a long fought legal battle, battle in the Zim case uh, with Lambda Legal and some other partners. Um, additionally, the, another great thing that happened in regards to the passport um, issuing of passports is that now you can self attest to your gender so you do not need a court order. Um, this is very big. There's a few other states around the country that have been doing this. Um, and now at the federal level, you can self-attest. That's just a fancy word for saying uh, you have to sign a paper saying you are who you are and you're able to uh, get the update that you need. Yeah, and what that also means is you no, need, no longer need a doctor's letter, which is what you needed for a passport. So this is that's gonna happen in about the next year meaning that we should be able to have X gender markers on passports in the next year. But as of right now, you can self attest to what your gender identity is that you want on a passport. There are 21 other states that allow for X markers on, for example, driver's license or state ID cards. Um, the state of Texas is not one of those and the state of Texas is probably gonna go kicking and screaming. Uh, with respect to that, but I can tell you that there's another lawyer, uh, Claire Bowe, who's been a long time uh, LGBT activist who does the trainings that Lambda does uh, with us uh, twice a month. And um, Claire and I drafted legislation to turn name and gender marker changes or gender marker corrections into an administrative process uh, this last le legislative session, and we had uh, senators and representatives from the House, we got both, we got uptake on both. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time to happen, probably in our state, but know that there are people on the ground trying to make those changes to make it easier for you to do that and make it easier for there to be X markers in Texas. And for just the second part of that question about the birth certificate, yes, you are allowed to. Uh, uh, change the name on a birth certificate only. All right, so now to our next question. Um, when you need people to testify, are we going, uh, do they have to come down to Austin and do it in person? So the short answer is right now, that is what's happening. But through the Equality Texas website, they both have a bill tracker. So you can go look and see what anti-LGBT bills have been filed during the special session. And 
they also have on their website a portal where you can write out your written testimony and they will then print that written testimony and take it to the Capitol and get it into the public record, which is part of what we need. It's not just that oral testimony um, that we need y'all to be doing, but it's also that written testimony. So while right now there's not Zoom testimony and there really wasn't during the regular session, even when we were under lockdown, um, only certain individuals would be invited to give in-person testimony or Zoom testimony. Um, we'll see what happens with the pandem pandemic as we go forward, but go to Equality Texas's website, look at, for on the place on the website where you can submit written testimony, write about a page and a half about the impact on you and your family, personal knowledge, and then they will take care of it for us. Thank you. We have uh, one more question. Um, will there be problems with different gender markers on your passport and state ID and, and birth certificate if they receive the X gender marker? Gilly, you want to take that one and I'll, I'll follow up? Um, you know, I, I don't really know quite, quite uh, the answer. So Shelly, if you want to get, uh, take that one. So I think the short answer is we don't really know. So Gilly got it, hit the nail on the head. Um, the, so for the purposes of a passport, you're going to be fine. So in other words, I don't see any problem with having an X marker on a passport and then having your Texas driver's license say male or female. The conflict should not be a problem going forward to the extent that you would need those documents to prove who you are for a job or to prove, um, you know, for example, if you're going to get some sort of um, refund from FedGov, that shouldn't be a problem. So I don't anticipate there being any issue there. I think that was the last of the questions. Um, if anyone wants to make some closing remarks. All right, uh, I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, I think it's very important when we have uh, this information that we share with others uh, and that we go out and we seek this information. Um, so I want to thank our panelists today for uh, coming and speaking. I really want to thank um, everyone who came out and um, spoke, uh, everyone who came out and listened. Um, be sure to let other people know about uh, other ones that we are going to have, other panels. Uh, this should be recurring uh, either monthly or bi-monthly, but we will let you, let you all know, and we hope uh, that you'll come out next time. Thank you. And also, thank you, Dr. for Chains, for hosting this as well. Special thanks. All right, thank you all for joining. You have a great rest of your evening.